God our Father and from the Lord Jesus, dear friends. The part of God's word that we'll give our attention to this week comes from the prophet Isaiah once again. We'll get to those verses in just a few minutes. But I want to start here. What words do you generally associate with this season of the year, the season of Advent and Christmas? What are the words that you maybe see on some of the decorations that you put up in your homes at this time of the year? Or on some of the ornaments that hang on your trees? Every year on both of our campuses here at Bethany, we bring out the Advent wreath and the candles. Each of those candles has a word associated with it that is emblematic of the season. The words vary a little bit depending on the tradition, but for the most part, there is a hope candle, there is a faith candle, there is a joy candle, and there is a love candle. And of course, right in the middle of them all is that Christ candle. To these words, maybe we would add a few others, things like peace, or light, or life. All of these words help to define the season for what it is. But what about that one? As far as I know, there isn't any tradition that includes a judgment candle on the Advent wreath. How many of you have a decoration like this one that you bring out of the basement each year at Christmas time? His judgment cometh, and that right soon. The word seems a little bit out of place for the season, doesn't it? And yet, in the story of our salvation, judgment is found at the beginning, at the end, and everywhere in between. As we turn to the prophet Isaiah again this week, he shows us that judgment really is a fitting word for this season. And so we're happy to pray Come, Lord Jesus, as judge. Judgment is what made this season of the year necessary. At the beginning, everything was very good, just as God had said. There was perfect peace and perfect harmony between God and man, between Adam and Eve, and among all of God's creation. God had made a perfect world and a perfect home in the Garden of Eden. He gave it to Adam and Eve so that they could enjoy it and take care of it. But he told them there's one tree in the middle of that garden that's not for you. Don't eat the fruit from that tree because if you eat it, you will surely die. Well, we know what happened, of course. They disobeyed, they ate, and God's word stood. His judgment came. He said, because you ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. To dust you will return. As I said, you will surely die. But right alongside of that judgment came God's promise. A promise to send a Savior who would restore the perfection of Eden that mankind had ruined by their sin. And so over the centuries that followed, God repeated, he clarified that promise for his people. He told his people that this Savior that was coming would be the offspring of faithful believers like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He told them that this Savior would be the descendant of powerful and glorious kings like David and Solomon. For the people of Israel who lived under the rule of those kings They must have thought that at any moment, news might ring out from that palace in Jerusalem that the Savior had been born. Everything looked like it was coming together. But we know, of course, the Savior wasn't born in a palace, but in a manger. He wasn't born in Jerusalem, but in Bethlehem. And why? Well, because of God's judgment. The royal line through whom the Savior would come had grown rotten to the core. One wicked and idolatrous king followed another. And despite the parade of prophets that God sent, 
to plead with his people and their leaders to change their ways and to warn them about what would happen if they did not. Still, they refused to repent. And so God's judgment came again. That royal house of David and Solomon was reduced to nothing. Like a dry, dead stump where once there was a towering oak tree. Truly the same message and the same warning that we heard John the Baptist declare in our Gospel reading today. He said, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. God is serious when he speaks warning about sin and judgment. The people of Israel had grown confident and comfortable in their belief that their heritage as children of Abraham, their connection to great kings like David and Solomon, meant that all was right in their relationship with God. Never mind the fact that their lives, for the most part, revealed very little of a relationship with God whatsoever. In the same way, sometimes we can grow a little too comfortable, confident, thinking, you know, I'm a member of a Christian church, I was baptized, I was confirmed, all is good. Never mind the fact that maybe our worship life is not what it used to be, or not what it ought to be. Never mind the fact that maybe our Bibles or devotional books at home have gathered a lot of dust lately. Never mind the fact that maybe our offerings are not exactly in line with the tremendous way that God has blessed us in our lives, or our service in His kingdom tends to take a back seat to everything else that we have going on in our lives. But John's words stand, produce fruit, and every tree that does not will be cut down. The sad history of God's people Israel stands as a warning for us about how serious God is. Paul said in our lesson earlier, everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. When God speaks about sin and judgment, He means it, and He showed that. The same thing is true when it comes to His promises. Though God's Acts had already done its work on the kingdom of Judah. His promises to his people and to all people would still stand. That's where the prophet Isaiah picks up the story for us in our verses today. He says a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, from that ruined kingdom of David and Solomon. And from his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of might, the Spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. Out of that judgment that God brought on the kingdom of Judah came Jesus. The branch who grew up from the stump of Jesse. The one who came to be our judge. God equipped Jesus for the important work He came to do by pouring out His Spirit on Him. He gave Him the Spirit of wisdom and understanding that Jesus would know the hearts and ways of man just as He knows the heart and ways of God. He gave Him the Spirit of counsel and of might. We think of those names that Isaiah applied to the Savior of wonderful counselor and mighty God. Jesus came into this world with a plan for our salvation and He counsels us about that plan in His Word. Jesus came with the might or power to carry out that plan and the power 
to bring our hearts into line with his saving plan. God gave him the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. Jesus knew what God's will for him in this world was. To live a perfectly holy life and then to die innocently on that cross. And Jesus delighted in being obedient to that will. Jesus delighted in God's will every step of the way in his life. And so this leader this judge, this branch, was so very different from even the best of the leaders of God's people that came before him. That difference is seen especially in the way that Jesus came to judge the nations. Outward appearances don't carry any weight in his courtroom. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes. Unreliable testimony is not going to sway his decisions. He will not decide by what he hears with his ears. And when Jesus judges, he gets right to the heart of the matter. Isaiah says he judges with righteousness. His word, his law and his gospel, the rod of his mouth or the breath of his lips, as Isaiah calls it, is what's going to do the work. His word declares that there is no one in this world who does good, not even one. It says that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And so that means that all of us are the poor and needy that Isaiah speaks about here. On our own, none of us has the righteousness that God demands, and therefore all of us deserve that judgment. But see, that's what makes this judge so very different because he gives us the righteousness that we need this branch from jesse's stump came and led a perfectly righteous life for all people this judge that god promised was judged by god himself for the sins of all people and in his word he tells us that his righteousness becomes our own through faith in Him, and spares us from the judgment that we rightly deserve. When Isaiah says that Jesus comes to judge the world in righteousness, he means the same thing that Jesus himself said in John chapter 3. Whoever believes in Jesus has eternal life. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned. That's the righteous judgment of forgiveness that we have received through faith in Jesus. But for those who reject this branch, the righteous judgment comes differently. Whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. When Jesus, the righteous judge, judges us righteous in his sight through faith in him, then we become heirs of that perfect, glorious, and righteous kingdom that he promises to his people. A kingdom that David and Solomon would have envied, but one that all of us as God's people will get to enjoy. Isaiah describes it. He says, The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and the little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together. And the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den. And the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's the fruit of the righteous judgment that Jesus has pronounced on us that we're going to get to enjoy. Now, we don't want to misunderstand, and we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. We're not looking for this righteous, peaceful kingdom to be established here on earth. God has never promised that. It's true that we get a glimpse of this peaceful kingdom within God's church. That's what we spoke about last week, how peace reigns in Christ's church because of the peace that he established between God and man. But we know that sin and division is still 
very much alive in this fallen world. And so what Isaiah speaks of here is really looking forward to that perfect heavenly kingdom that's waiting for us, the one that Jesus has prepared. There we won't just see glimpses of this perfect peace. We'll have it in all of its fullness and for all eternity. And can you imagine what this kingdom that Isaiah describes is going to be like? Predator and prey existing together. Perfect peace and harmony. The little child reaching into the viper's den and having nothing whatsoever to fear. It must have been just the way things were in the Garden of Eden. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. And all of this comes from a stump. All because God made a promise to judge Jesus instead of us so that we might receive from Jesus the righteous judgment that we needed. And so judgment really is a fitting word for the season. I'm not suggesting that we add another candle to our Advent wreath for judgment. But look at what Isaiah says about our judge in the final verse of this section. In that day, our judge, the root of Jesse, will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. The judge that God judged for us will rally the nations to himself at the very place where that judgment was carried out. In John chapter 12, Jesus says, I, when I am lifted up from the earth, talking about his death on the cross, will draw all men to myself. The banner of the cross that invites the nations to find in Jesus the righteous judgment that comes only from him and their share in the glorious kingdom that he has prepared for them. That banner is emblazoned with these words from our judge. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, all you who are poor and needy, and I will give you rest, a glorious place of rest. And so we're glad to pray. Come, Lord Jesus, as judge. Amen. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.